Hope and Patience with Amelia Rope, a podcast about business, well-being and chocolate. Hello and welcome to Hope and Patience. It's me, Amelia Rope, ex-chocolate creator, now podcast creator and your host. If you're new to Hope and Patience, it's great to have you join us. We're going to be exploring, delving into the stories of founders and dipping into pearls of wisdom from well-being experts. It's about discovery. The guests will be inspirational and the precious insights they share absolute gems. In the podcast that Harriet Hastings, the lovely woman from the Biscuiteers, came, I mentioned that I had purchased a pair, a pair, well, it is a pair, two weights that I was trying to get active with my new sedentary lifestyle. Well, this Sunday, I had the weights on the floor and I charged into them with no shoes and I am now nursing a broken toe on my left foot. So I think they should carry a health warning to say, do not put on the floor. Anyway, back to the podcast and my guest who is here today. He is a very exciting guy. He is a man who took a motorbike or rode a motorbike from the UK through Africa to Cape Town. And instead of flying back, he then decided to go 20,000 miles for 10 months to crisscross to come back to the UK. He's an author of a trilogy He's visited 100 countries. He's in a rock band. He's a lecturer at the Royal Geographical Society. He is the founder of the award-winning Wild Frontiers, the one and only Johnny Bilby. Hello, Johnny. Uh, Good morning. Hi. It's lovely to have you on the show. What an intro, goodness. I know, there you go. When I was doing my interview prep for Johnny, I was looking into why he had set up his business and just exploring, and it made me think of um, catalysts in our lives. And when you meet a person or you go to a place or something happens and it propels you out of what you were thinking you were going to be doing for a chunk of your life into a really different path. And I have to say that I'm sitting opposite the guy who was my catalyst in the way that he dumped me. (laughs) And I sobbed and I sobbed and I sobbed and I did a real Bridget Jones for quite a few months. And then I thought, get a grip, move on. And so I applied to go on MasterChef. And through that, it opened the most phenomenal doors and and led me to set up my chocolate business. Anyway, enough about me. Johnny, with his journey, had a very poignant, tragic catalyst, which led him into his fascinating chapters of setting up Wild Frontiers. So over to you, Johnny. Sadly, we've got sort of condensed time. My producer will be looking at his watch. So I'd love to hear the story of how you set up Wild Frontiers. Yeah, so um, I was in a a rock band in the late 80s in London. We were called the Tin Gods. We played all over town and different parts of the country. And during that time, I was um, living with a girl called Melanie. After about five years of waiting for me to become famous, she decided that she'd had enough of that and wanted to go off traveling. And as she was far more important to me than the band, uh, I quit and we went off uh, to uh, Southeast Asia, first of all Thailand, and then traveled to India, where very sadly Melanie died one morning uh, on a houseboat in Kashmir. And yeah, talking of catalysts, that set in motion a chain of events that really lead to me being here today talking to you about my life in travel and entrepreneurship. Um, Grief is an incredibly powerful energy. It's obviously very difficult to deal with at the time, but if if kind of used right, and I don't necessarily mean consciously, um, it it can lead to some incredible things. And uh, through that journey of grief, um, three huge trips, really exploring what grief was, what life was all about, whether it was worth living or not. As you say, riding my motorbike around Africa um, and then walking through parts of India, Pakistan and Afghanistan and then riding a horse along the Silk Road led to books, led to TV programs and ultimately led to Wild Frontiers and the travel company that I now run. So, yeah, everything was really triggered from that one very tragic moment, goodness, 30 years ago. Yeah, quite uh, quite some catalyst, it has to be said. So with um, the with running Wild Frontiers, 
Um, it's an adventure travel company, as we've said. There must be a massive amount of logistics and um, sort of getting people, A, on a trip, and then you've got to get ground handlers. How do you cope with that sort of challenge? Well, now, of course, I have a team of people that look after those aspects of it. When I started the business 20 years ago, everything that you've mentioned there, I had to do myself. So I had to put together an itinerary, which I did in Pakistan, which I'd kind of learned from my second, the journey that culminated in my second book. Um, you find people that can help you deliver that. You then put an advert in the paper and get clients to sign up onto it. And to cut a very long story short, um, that just expands over time and you get more people in to help you organize those aspects of it, be it the marketing to get the clients or the operational staff to run the trips. Um, and ultimately, you, you build a business, which is what I've done now. And we have 60 staff across three continents, in America, in Southeast Asia, and in uh, in London, of course. Um, yeah, and we run a, a great deal of uh, many group tours and tailor-made private holidays a, a, as a result. Is that a massive responsibility? I mean, 60 staff is huge on the payroll, isn't it? I always think uh, yes, of payrolls, yes, but pensions. And... Yeah, no, it, it, it's, a, it's a challenging business travel. It's very competitive. It's quite low margins. Um, people, particularly in Britain, Britain has, I think, the most advanced travel service industry in the world. I mean, you know, there are hundreds and hundreds of travel companies offering everything from, you know, diving with sharks to cooking lessons in Tuscany to Disneyland to whatever it is you want to do. You can do it from through a British company. So to stand out from the crowd and um, and, and really be offering something different, unique and, and uh uh, something that's wanted by the public is not easy. But I think we've done a good job of that. And I think my background in pure adventure travel, by which I mean real travel, authentic travel, travel for the sake of travel rather than a commercial uh, background setting it up, I think has led very well to that and has, gives our clients now as, as close as possible that real travel experience. It is amazing. I mean, his trips, you go so off piece. They are like no other trip. Uh, so, yeah, that, they are absolutely amazing. With the whole climate change situation that's happening now and um, people very aware of travel and getting on an aeroplane, I saw that you are doing a, a carbon reduction plan with the Eco Act in 2020. That's right. How, how do you go about that? And will the consumer be willing to contribute more for responsible travel or will they expect it in, in the price? We're now in a in a in a real game changing situation. I think um, while Frontiers were the first company, as far as I know, in the UK to automatically offset all flights, we did that from two thousand and five, and we've been doing it ever since, Brilliant. and have paid thousands and thousands of pounds towards offsetting projects. Um, this year, we've gone one stage further, and we are now offsetting the carbon emissions from the actual trips people do. But what we're trying to do is to become a carbon neutral company. That takes time. It's obviously not just with the trips that we're running, carbon, carbon neutralizing those, but also the office in London, the office in America, etc. Um, there are a number of ways in which one does that. Uh, and we're exploring all sorts of ones, which is tree planting, which is various carbon offsetting projects. Um, the interesting thing, of course, is how the public are reacting to that. For some people, they don't really care. Others, care a lot. And we have everything in between. We had a couple um, yesterday that booked uh, three trips with us in Central Asia, and they're getting there by train, which is a hell How of a big journey in though. itself and getting back by train. Wow. So it's literally a kind of two and a half week journey there. They do three trips with us back to back. So they've got six weeks of travel with us, and then they do a two and a half week journey back. Now, of course, that's fine if you're retired and you can do that. If you're not, if you're working like most of us, then obviously you can't and you have to pick and choose how you choose to reduce your own carbon uh, footprints. But we're offering many more train uh, options to get to kind of European destinations. Um, obviously, that becomes more tricky when you're talking long haul. Flights are the big thing. That, mm. that, that's the big issue. And that's what we're trying to cut down, making sure we fly direct. And for our staff that go on recce's to make sure the trips are good, rather than go doing two a year, we'll do one longer one a year, things like that, as well as, as I say, all the kind of offsetting stuff that we're doing. Being an explorer and an adventurer, do you find that you have itchy feet if you're sitting at your desk? 
Ah, it's really funny. I mean, you know, I've been doing this now for 20 years. And before that, I was 10 years, you know, doing these big journeys uh, for, for book writing. Um, honestly, no. Uh, I mean, I'm lucky in that I leave London. I love London and I've lived here for however many years. Um, but I have always left London and gone away. And I still enjoy going away. But I get frustrated sometimes that I have to go away too much. So when I see that I've got six weeks in the country, I, that for me is a leap of joy. And I go, wow, good, I'm here for six weeks. I can actually see my friends. I can do stuff uh, here. It sounds like a very first world problem to have to be going away all the time. But um, no, and also running a business, you need to be around to run it. You know, you can't keep jetting off to the the, the likes of Guatemala, where I was over Christmas or, or, or Cambodia or, yeah. So you have to be around to run a business. And how does your lovely wife, Anna, cope when you go away? Or does she come with you on trips? <laughs> does she say, hey, take me with yeah, you? Yeah, she generally comes with me. <laughs> I mean, it depends. For example, next week I'm uh, off to America to to go to the office there. She doesn't come to that, uh, you know, when I'm doing business trips. But she certainly tries to muscle her way in when, when I'm doing uh, more uh, kind of exploratory trips, yeah. A wise woman, I think. <laughs> and finally, Johnny, with um, things like the political, with political turmoil and governments going pear shaped and and war zones, how does that? Because some of your the countries that you visit and the areas are really off the beaten track. How does that affect your trips? Well, I think the first thing to say is that ninety percent of our tours and holidays that people book with us are to places that are not deemed. Uh, dangerous by the foreign office or, or whatever. I mean, our, our top destination is India. We do an awful lot of stuff in Southeast Asia. We do a lot in along the Silk Road countries, uh, parts of Africa, parts of Latin America. So most of those places are, are deemed safe and, and fine. Um, we do, and this is really my background, what I love. And when I traveled um, back in the 90s, I, I realized very quickly that the perception of danger of some of these supposedly dangerous countries was just not what the reality was like on the ground and 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 actually they were nothing like as dangerous and so you know we do run trips we run one, one trip a year or maybe two trips a year to afghanistan we run a trip to the congo we run a trip uh, up to kashmir a few trips to kashmir um and the reality is that they are really pretty safe um the question of running a business that has that at its core um is that we are constantly being chapped challenged in the travel business. Um, there are all sorts of, of, of issues, be it political, be it health-wise, yeah, um, all, all sorts of things. And, and therefore, we constantly have to, um, you know, be very malleable and jump uh, whichever way we need to jump, given the circumstances. It, it, it were ever thus, and I suspect always will be. So moving on to mindset before we have our exciting chocolate break. Mm -hmm. And my goodness, have we got a bar to share. Um, with decision making, Johnny, what sort of mindset are you in when you make really effective good decisions? And where do you think your mindset slips when you make um, more ineffective, sort of poorer decisions? Wow, I don't know that I've ever really thought about that. I, I'm now is your chance. <laughs> I'm always of the opinion that it's better to make a decision and get it wrong than not make a decision at all. And being a boss of a company, you make decisions every day. And honestly, I rarely think that. I mean, there are obviously big decisions that you do think hard about, but I go with my gut feeling. I have good people around me that I get advice off. Um, I don't run Wild Frontiers autocratically. We run it as a business with a team of people um, that, that kind of sit at the top of the business and we discuss issues and we make decisions accordingly. So I'm very lucky that I have a good team of people around me to help me make those decisions. I have a chairman as well who's great. He helps a lot uh, helping with the really tricky stuff that maybe I have to go above the senior leadership team to make those decisions. Um, in terms of my, 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 my space in my head as to when I make a good or a bad decision, I don't know that there's any particular uh, moment. It's just, you know, sometimes you get it right and sometimes you get it wrong. Yeah. And, and the, the joy is that one mainly gets more right than wrong. I guess. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't be running a successful business. <laughs> no, you, you certainly wouldn't. Do you have, I mean, I have a quite harsh inner critic who, who can be quite ruthless on myself and I have to really get it in check. Do you have a sort of internal chatter and inner critic that um, gives you a hard time at all? <laughs> 
I don't think so. I mean, I think a lot about stuff in my head, but I'm generally pretty self-confident about making decisions in the space that I have to make business decisions. I mean, I've been doing this business now for 20 years. I've built it from nothing. Um, I think I have a fairly good reputation or Wild Frontiers has a good reputation for doing what we do. And we just, you know, I think, I remember I read something which Richard Branson said years ago, which kind of stuck with me, which is just stick to your, stick to your, uh, your, your, your inner feelings. Don't let, you know, other things push you to the side. Just, just go with your core instinct. That's the word instinct. Go with your instinct and it will be okay. And generally speaking, it is. Do you think you're an optimist or a pessimist? Oh God, that's a good question. I, I would always call myself an optimist, but I am quite a realist as well. So I, I'm I do take some quite bold decisions with Wild Frontiers. I probably take more bold decisions with Wild Frontiers than I do personally. But um, uh, yeah, so I mean, I'm always thinking things will turn out all right. And would you say that you're introvert, extrovert or an ambivert? What is an ambivert? An ambivert. Somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's um, a sort of mishmash, a merge. A yeah, merge. I'm probably that. I used to be an extrovert. I'm becoming more introverted. So I'm probably, uh, what, an ambivert? An ambivert. I'm an ambivert. Sounds like an animal. It does. An amp amphibian. Yes. Probably not quite so much of that. But no. Yeah. And finally, how do you, you must need a lot of energy and motivation to keep the whole thing moving forward, growing on track. How do you sustain that? Uh, it, it, it's You're on a conveyor belt. You can't really get off it. You know, you've got 60 people working for you. You've got thousands of clients a year. You've got a marketing machine that's churning stuff out. You've got new product that's ideas that are coming forward. You're, you're, you just can't step off it. I mean, the only way you can is just to throw the towel in. And I'm not ready to do that. I'm not old enough to do that. I love the work that we do. I love the trips that we that we run. I had a great experience this Christmas. I, I went on a trip as a client, really. I There was a tour leader. There was, there were you know, everything was set up. I hadn't even read the itinerary. It was to Guatemala. And you know, I just watched everybody, all the real clients on that trip and what they got out of it. And it was really, uh, it, it was a, a really invigorating experience to see that what we do really moves people as much as it does. And it, it kind of reminded me why I started the business in the first place and um, and was, was, was a great experience. So I, I find it just, you know, it, it's just life. It carries on and you keep doing it because that's what you do. You do. So now we are about to tuck in to the bar of chocolate Whoa. that's been staring its face, staring itself in the face. Sorry, my work, my my voice is not great today. And it is a really designer bar, so of chocolate that Johnny has selected. In fact, it set the business back nine pounds eighty six pence. Everybody, <laughs> so it's probably not going to be something that you're going to rush out and buy. But it is the most superb chocolate, and it's a real treat to be eating superb chocolate. So the bar is Amade's Chuao, and it is a 70% dark chocolate. So Johnny, you open that up and let's have a piece of that. And I will tell our listeners a little bit about it. So it is made from a highly sought after cocoa bean, which is the Chuao. It's from a protected area in Venezuela. Uh, it's named after the plantation, and it's in the Aragua Valley. Have you been to Venezuela, Johnny? Uh, do you know, I haven't. It's the one country I would love to go to. Sadly, politically, it's slightly beyond the pale slightly, at the moment. But slightly edgy at the moment. We hope we'll be able to go there again soon. Wild Frontiers has run trips there, and they were very successful, but it's just uh, it's difficult at the moment. But I'm about to pop this into yeah, my mouth. Yeah, you pop that in. It's um, There are 100 farmers who farm these cocoa beans. They have their own co-op, and it is it translates to the word noble bean. Mm. So, you're chomping away. You're mm. supposed to suck on no, the No, no, thing, no, no, no. You have to chomp it and then you suck it. You've got to break it up in your mouth and then you suck I it. Have some of your expensive yeah, chocolate. a typical <laughs> producer had suddenly put his head in. I personally, so I personally. You suck it straight, dude. I suck it Interesting. straight. Interesting. And then I just let it go As down the on the said tongue. To the, bishop. Um, <laughs> the great thing about this chocolate, and I know it's expensive, is that you can keep it in your mouth, as I'm talking here, for quite a long <laughs> no, time. You break yours. And, and you only need one piece. It is so rich and so delicious. Um, and, 
I mean, South America has some fantastic chocolate, as you well know, from yeah. Colombia, from Peru, from Ecuador, etc. But this is the piece de resistance. Yeah, it is. It is extremely good. So if you want a treat, I would t I would head out and get yourself a bar. You can buy it online. So you see, I, you've finished yours already. No, no, I've, still... I've got it in the corner of my oh, mouth. I'm trying okay. to lead an interview, okay. you see. So right, I'm trying right, to be right, professional. Right, right. Otherwise, we'd have to <laughs> stop for about 10 minutes. I think the producer in the studio would be saying, hey, yep, we're, yep. we're running out of time. Okay. So I'm trying to be um, sort of You're doing disciplined. A good job. Thanks, JB. So now we're going to pick on a few thoughts of words, what they mean to you. So the word entrepreneur is much banded around. What do you, I see you as an entrepreneur. What do you see as an entrepreneur? Yeah, interesting. I don't really, I mean, yes, people say I'm, I'm a travel entrepreneur. Well, maybe I am. For me, an entrepreneur is somebody that's probably a multiple entrepreneur, somebody that does lots of businesses, that's, that, that, you know, works in different areas and buys this and does that and sets up one thing or another. Oh, interesting. Uh, I mean, that, I don't know whether that's right or wrong. Um, I see myself as somebody that set up one business basically because I was unemployable. I hadn't, I've only had one job in my life. That was when I was 20, just around the corner from here, actually, in Brewer Street. Um, worked for a video company. Um, got made redundant after a year and formed my band. And so life kind of carried on. Tin Gods, by the way. <laughs> Tin Gods. Can you download it or not? Do you know, sadly, I don't think you Well, you can on YouTube. Yes, <laughs> there you on go. YouTube. YouTube. Um, and uh, so, you know, really, I set up a business because out, out of necessity as much as anything. Um so am I an entrepreneur? Yes, I guess I am in the technical sense. But um, for me, entrepreneurship is is uh, these guys that, that set up multiple businesses, you know, your Richard Branson's of this world and that sort of thing. Whereas I don't think I'm going to set up another business. I, I've set up a charity, which is great, the Wild Frontiers yeah, Foundation. That's and that's a great thing to be doing. And, and I love that. And I want to do more of that. Um, but uh, but as regards kind of setting up a completely different business, no, I, I have bought businesses into Wild Frontiers, which has been fun and interesting and challenging, um, which I think is, uh, you know, that's probably part of entrepreneurship. But yeah, I, I consider myself um, more of just a businessman, really, in travel. So um, Henry Ford, I love quotes, as mm. listeners are going to pick up on this because every show seems to have them plopped in. But Henry Ford, who is the founder of Ford Motor Company, who most definitely was an entrepreneur, says failure is simply the opportunity to begin again, this time more intelligently. How do you see failure? Yeah, what was the Nelson Mandela quote? There's no such thing as losing. You either win or learn. Oh, and I thought that, that was a great quote. Um, how do I see success or failure? Um you know, some some things that we've done with Wild Frontiers haven't worked. Um, other things do. I, I I totally agree with both those quotes. You you know, you don't kind of knock yourself down. You say, okay, well that didn't work. Let's get on and try something else. Um, and as long as the overall business is working, moving in the right direction, then I think that's fine. So we're going to head into the well-being section now. Johnny and I, um, while we were waiting for the producer to arrive. Um, <laughs> he's popped his head up. So, um, we're talking about mental well-being and mental sort of health when you're a founder because it, it is really, really tough. And at times it can be bleak and you can feel quite alone when you make the decisions. Johnny, you w share some thoughts, if you're happy to, on, on founders and mental health. Yeah, uh, there's been so much of it recently. And, and I see it in the workplace. I do. I mean, I think the ability to switch off from work is getting harder and harder in the ways uh, all of our lives are connected. Um, and our constant connectivity to work makes it very hard for for employees to switch off. But a lot of the talk that I hear is around employees, which, of course, is fine. And we need to make sure the well-being and mental health of our staff is is all as good as it can be. But, um, you know, I, I was kind of almost shouting at the radio the other day saying, well, yeah, but what about the employers? You know, we have a great deal of stress as well. We never leave our work. We, you know, at two o'clock this morning, I'm lying in bed thinking about a, an aspect of work. Um, so I, I think it's it's becoming very challenging. I particularly find it challenging because when I travel, I'm still working. Um, so for me, the only time I get to really have a holiday is 
if I take a villa in Italy, which is, you know, people often ask me, they, they don't expect me to have that sort of holiday. But of course, if I go to Cuba or I go to India or I go to Cambodia, I'm not on holiday. I'm videoing, I'm writing blogs, I'm seeing, you know, our, tour, our, our, our guides, how well they perform. I'm having a good experience, don't get me wrong, but it's not a holiday. So it's sometimes very hard, I think, for uh, founders of businesses to 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 step back and actually really take a proper break now in the modern world probably much harder than it used to be um you know i used to think of it as a badge of honor i worked 80 hours this week now now i think that's just rubbish you know i think a badge of honor should be i worked 30 hours this week and did a load of really fun things it's that whole thing of thinking smart or something isn't that what they call it uh, sounds good i mean yes that's right thinking smart just just well, having a balance, and yeah. I think that is what becomes very difficult when you are an entrepreneur running a business. Uh, you say, I don't have a family. I have a lovely wife, but I don't have kids and stuff. And I'm sure that uh, takes you out of your work mode if you do. Um, and if you don't, then you have to find other ways to relax and, and really kind of cut off from from the work space in your head. So what do you do to relax, Johnny? Not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really not very good at relaxing. I, I work pretty much, uh, you know, a, a great deal of the time. Um, yeah, I, I I like to go out of London at weekends. I think that's always good. I think if I stay in London at weekends, then I end up kind of just slipping back into work mode. Um and yes, making sure I do have those kind of little breaks that 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 allow me to um, to switch off. Whether that's you know my my in laws have got a, a, a have got a flat in Skipton, go up there to walk in the Yorkshire oh, Dales lovely. is great. Yeah. Um, you know, making sure I do get to places like Italy where I'm we do not sell and and I'm not going to sell anytime soon, and therefore I can have a proper a proper break. But. In all honesty, I'm not good at it. Right. So he's not an example, listeners, of well-being for founders. He no, needs to change. I'm not. Now. Yes, I do, and I, and I am working on that. I'm I'm looking at trying to, um, yeah, make some changes as far as that's concerned. It's really tough. I mean, that was one reason why I moved out of chocolate was I found I didn't get a work-life balance. Yeah. And my mental health really suffered. Yeah. And often when you've got investors, it's very difficult to open that side up because you know you've got to keep on going. You know that you've got to try and deliver on their investment, and it's it's just it's Massive. It's yeah, and when you've got sixty staff, you know that people yeah. are relying on you to run the business well, and therefore you have to think about it all the time. So I'm trying to make some changes at the moment that will give me a better work life balance. So dare I ask you, how do you sleep? I mean, and the other thing is with you is that you've obviously you're moving around with time zones. So yeah. not only is it stress, it's sort of massaged by the the time zone thing. So how mm. how do you sleep? To be honest, I don't sleep too badly. Funnily enough, last night I didn't have a particularly good night, but that's just kind of random. Um, when I go to America, our office is on the West Coast, which is worse than it being on the East Coast. So I literally, do, I mean, it's awful there. During the week, I end up doing kind of almost 16-hour days because I wake up at four in the morning and work with the London office for about five hours. Then I go into the American office for another five, six, seven, eight, eight hours, um, go to bed at eight o'clock and, and wake up again at four. You don't uh, look as if you, I mean, I have to say to the listeners check out photos of him but he really looks very he looks very healthy you know you look well, as if you sort of slept for 12 hours you don't look as if you you no, I, that I don't sleep too badly um it goes through periods of course when you've got uh things that really are stressing you out then of course you you know I, you get your four hours and then you wake up for two hours and then you might get another hour or two if you're lucky um jet lag is always a difficult one. Melatonin is the answer mm -hmm. I've found. Um, in America, you can buy these brilliant little drinks. They're like, they're, they're in a size of a Yakult um, bottle and they're called, um, uh, uh, what are they called? Uh, dream sleep. And they're just brilliant. One of those every night. I wonder and why they don't sell them over here. You're allowed to bring them over. No, well, yeah, you're allowed to bring them over, but you're not, they don't sell melatonin over the counter. But I tell you what, that sorts your jet lag out in a flash. So you've probably got a seller load. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I will be buying more in America next week, yes. <laughs> So, Johnny, um, do you have your phone off or on when you sleep? And if oh, you have I, it, 
Oh, and do you have it on silent? No, I do not take my phone into my bedroom. It's really good. My wife does, which annoys the hell out of no, me. No, she needs to switch but, hers off and leave but, it from but, the bedroom. But, you know, she likes kind of catching up on Facebook and things. No, I don't. I leave my phone downstairs. In fact, I try not to look at my phone after. I mean, obviously, with, with an American office, you're still getting emails coming in. Uh, you know, and I, I, I do sometimes have to check emails until eight o'clock at night. But, but I stop then. I leave the phone and I don't go back to it until the morning. Things like exercise. I mean, he's very long and lean. <laughs> but do you do you run? Do you walk? Uh, I, do you... I I have a cross trainer at home, and I use it every morning. And I do a number. I do half an hour's worth of exercise every morning. Gosh, that's good. And yeah, I think otherwise, crikey, you're sitting behind a desk all yep. day. You know, it's it's not particularly healthy. So, yeah, I do. I mean, I'm not sure that that's necessarily enough, but it's what I get. I think it's very good. So do you, you obviously with the well-being, you don't have a sort of daily ritual as to looking after yourself, do you? But no, a stupid question. I mean, friends of mine, I've got another great mate who does kind of meditation for 20 minutes a day. I just don't have the brain to do that. It's far, I mean, I say that I'm sure people as active as me um, do manage it. But um, no, I don't. I But I think I'm reasonably good at keeping a check on it. At the end of last year, I got really stressed and I knew I was stressed and Anna, my wife, knew I was stressed and we kind of did some things to kind of de-stress me. And mm-hmm. and it doesn't take much to de-stress you. That's mm-hmm. the thing. You've just got to be aware of it. And I think I'm reasonably good at being aware of when I am stressed. And sort of short, short little yeah. pockets. So even if it's just a long weekend, it's not two weeks no, holiday. No, absolutely. It's great. Get out of London. That's right. And exactly. just switch off yep. and leave your phone behind and listen yep. to the birds. Yep. Do you, you're a band player. Do you have a song that, not necessarily one of Tin Gods, that you listen to that you love that makes you feel a little bit sparkly? It's funny. Somebody asked me that the other day. Um, when I'm travelling, I don't tend to listen to music at all. I love to be connected to the place that I am. I, I mean, I would love to go to local gigs and that sort of thing. But but generally speaking, I don't really listen to music through headphones. I, I always feel too disconnected from the world around me. Um, I have so many favourite songs, it's difficult to say. Um, But if you were to really push me, I would probably say um, Comfortably Numb by Pink Floyd or London Calling by The Clash. Oh, yeah. Very good. Will the younger listeners know those? (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Perhaps. Well, check them out anyway. If yeah. you're if you're a little youngy, then yeah, I'm then afraid check music them out. for me kind of finished in about 1993. I think I don't really listen to because I don't have kids. No. I, you know, all my friends that have got kids. I need to rent kids a kid. bring kids bring new music into yep. their world. I don't really have that. So I, I yeah, I, I tend to just listen to old stuff. I have four lovely godchildren who keep me sort of on it. But it's that thing where you lose touch. I mean, yeah. I don't know the latest this, that, and the other. Um, so. Is there a favourite hideaway where you two just go to and it is just magical? Uh, do you mean in this country or, or generally? Free rain, free, free rain, rain free no rain, borders. Any, anywhere. Um, we, we, we love going back to India because India is kind of where I have to go to at least once or twice a year. We have an office there. Um, we do a great, Wild Frontiers does a lot of work there. We have a lot of friends there. So Anna and I often go over there and spend time. There's this wonderful place called Castle Bijaipur in Rajasthan where the owners of the castle are great friends of ours and we just go and chill out there for a while. Um, in Britain, this is exactly what I'm trying to find at the moment. We are trying to find some sort of little cottage somewhere that we can rent, which is proving very difficult to have a bolt hole because I think that's the problem. When you live in London all the time, you're just surrounded by concrete, by noise, by fumes, by all these things that, and and then you put your work on top of that. Yeah, it really manifests. It really manifests. And, and what you, you know, we, we notice it when we do go away on our own to stay in a cottage or to uh, a long weekend and wherever it might be, that you see the horizon, you see trees, you you breathe fresh air, you go for walks, you, you drink a nice bottle of wine, but in the right kind of context. Mm. And it really just de-stresses and you come back to work and, and you know, you, you, you're recharged. And that's what I think we're really trying to change this it's year. It's challenging finding somewhere that is near enough to London because you don't want to spend yeah. the whole time getting to no, the place no. and then quickly unpacking and then you're almost yeah. packing and coming back. And the, and a lot of the places that I, I sort of explore are places that everybody's there because it's in reach from London. Cornwall, that's the place you need to yeah, go to. Yeah, but again, that's it's a miles. long way it's to a get long, to. It's a long way to 
So the podcast is called Hope and Patience after my two phenomenal grandmothers. Where in life have you had to have a lot of hope? Did you not have a third one called Grace? <laughs> or a fourth called Charity? Indeed. Um, Actually, a friend of mine has, has got Valentine as her middle name. Okay. Well, that's... Which is really cool. But, yeah. but, you know, I think in that age, yeah, that, they did that, they sort of the name them after. Sorry, now I've forgotten the question. <laughs> she was Hope Rope as well. Hope is... Rope. <laughs> that... <laughs> okay, that's not great. Yeah. Anyway, I hope <clears throat> she's up above and yeah. proud that I'm commercialising their name. I'm sure That's a joke, be. by the way, commercialising mm. them. Um, okay, so <laughs> what I asked you was, lucky I've got my cue cards, mm. otherwise I'd forget. Where have you had to have a huge amount of hope in your life and also um, had to remember patients? I mean, two different events. Okay. Um, you know, after Melanie died, y y y I went into a spiral of decline and depression and w grief, basically. I wouldn't necessarily call it depression. I call it grief. Um, and I remember about a year and a half later getting on my motorbike and, and literally kind of turning south at Clapham Junction and just and just driving uh, kind of in, in, into another world, driving, of course, south into Africa. But um, but I knew that I was not so much running away from a problem, but I really felt that I was driving towards a new future. And I remember very clearly sitting on a sand dune in the middle of the Sahara Desert with my bike just below me, looking at this extraordinary sunset, feeling a new sense of life and a new sense of hope and a new sense of of this life was worth living even though i just experienced this kind of catastrophic event of the girl that i loved dying um that was the most um kind of powerful moment of hope and and has kind of led me on to where i am now as far as patience is concerned in business you have to be patient mm. all the time um and that's just the nature of the game you want things to happen tomorrow and they don't they take weeks months years to to come to fruition so um i think being a a boss of a business um requires all sorts of kind of characteristics but patience is certainly right up there patience is a real challenge i, I think i i'm i'm i want it now why isn't this done blah, 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 blah. Mm. and it's that whole thing just saying, you know what if it's not going to happen today it will happen tomorrow yeah but it's a very um different mindset so have you got any new trips that you want to share with the listeners well we, we always have new trips you know it's the nature of the game we have 60 staff who are all fanatic travelers and they're all pitching their ideas of new trips that they've discovered or that they did when they were on their gap year or whatever it, it is and new areas that they that they think we should be running um we will be uh bringing on a load of new tours in russia which i'm excited oh, about wow. i might have to book in on one of those 2021 which will be really cool uh, I've been to 101 countries, but I haven't been to Russia. So that's um, I've spent a lot of time in the former Soviet Union, but not Russia. So I'll be interested to go on those as well. We have new trips in Sri Lanka, in Nepal, uh, Japan, um, some in South America as well. So we're, we're, we're constantly kind of evolving. But check out the website, wildfrontierstravel.com, just to get that in there. Got to get that in there. <laughs> and you will see all the kind of wonderful, amazing places we can take you to. And I have been on one of the trips and I can vouch them. They are just brilliant. They are not run of the mill, beautifully done. You will have incredible memories from them. So book in. That's my little plug. Um, anyway, Johnny, thank you so much for joining me and the listeners. Uh, we're very lucky to have him here. We've kidnapped him from the Destinations Travel Show and with him off to the US on Monday. It is really, really kind of you to share your time. It's been an utter delight. I've really loved every minute. It's it's just a fantastic finish to my week. So thank you, thank you, thank you for coming along. Thank you very much. Pleasure is all mine. So today, the book I'd like to re recommend is The Relaxation Letters by Audrey Burns Ross. It's really, really good with loads of tips of relaxation. And one of them by the Most Reverend Desmond Tutu I loved what he does. He put, but for real relaxation, there is nothing like lying on my back on the floor and letting the music of Beethoven wash over me. So maybe that's what we should be trying to do. The quote for um, this show 
is by Kobe Bryant, who sadly died tragically in the helicopter accident with his daughter and other coaches. And it was a dreadful thing. And, and he was a really inspirational guy, so driven with his Mamba mentality. So the quote is, the most important thing is to try and inspire people so that they can be great in whatever they want to be. So with Johnny and spinning ideas of or, or thoughts about mental health this week, there's been quite a lot on burnout. And I, ha I suffered from burnout, as I'm sure many of you might have done uh, in my job before I set up my business. And it's a really strange sensation. And I struggled to get my head around it. But I think it's exciting that the way that we're all talking about it, the World Health Organization now includes it in its international classification of diseases. But I, it's really important that we do remember it and we don't push ourselves to the burnout position because there is scientific evidence now that says that it's a contributory factor to strokes, heart attacks, fatal hemorrhages. There's also a recent study that says it can, can contribute to dementia and type 2 diabetes. And really, it's that chronic stimulation of our fight-flight response, the sort of stress hormones, adrenaline and norepinephrine. I can't pronounce that properly, but you get the drift of it. What is disturbing or, or surprised me is that, it, that it's a higher percentage of the younger generation, so millennial employees, so age 23 to 38, 21% of the older um, brigade who, who suffer from it. And I, I was just wondering why. Is it because there's a mass, this mass digital overload, which I talk about a lot, but it, life is not the same with it? Is it because we have minimal or no switch off time? We're constantly doing, rushing to things. Is it because employers have unrealistic expectations of their employees? Is it a lack of boundaries from the employees saying, you know what, I can't do 12-hour days? Is it because of financial pressures? Or is it perhaps in our makeup? Are we more susceptible to burnout whereas others aren't? Just ideas and thoughts. It would be wonderful to hear your um, thoughts and ideas on it. Again, the best place to contact is through the website, hopeandpatience.co.uk. Anyway, that's, that's just my thoughts. So thank you all so much for finding Hope and Patience. I'll be back with another story soon. So make sure you subscribe to get the latest episode. And if you like what you hear, feel free to give us a positive rating, subscribe and spread the word. I'd also love to know what you'd like to hear more of, less of, and importantly too, none of. Just let me know again via the website. So until the next time, keep that sparkle. Bye. Hope and Patience with Amelia Rope. Join the conversation at hopeandpatience.co.uk or find Amelia on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at Hope and Pat.